Let me just introduce my fellow panelists here. Candido Brasher, uh, the CEO of Banco Itaú here in um, Sao Paulo. Paul Balk, who is uh, the CEO of, uh, chairman of the board actually, of Nestle, big international company. Maria Cristina Farias, journalist, member of the board and columnist of Folio Sao Paulo, very influential newspaper here in um, the region. In, in Brazil and in Latin America. Alejandro Ramirez, a very prominent Mexican business person, uh, very big in the movie business, uh, founder and CEO of Sinopolis, Sinopolis. And finally, Luisa Trajano and Nairi Woods. Luisa uh, runs a magazine called um, Luisa, also here in Brazil, and Nairi Woods is the Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford. The business at hand is um, leadership. And let me begin with a quick anecdote. I'm from Chile, and a reputable think tank a couple of years ago in my country ran a survey with the following question. What is the profession or role or job you admire most? In Chile, by far the most admired people with 42% are soap opera actors and actresses. Number two, football players. And this is before we beat Argentina twice in a row. Uh, sorry, couldn't help that. Journalists are somewhere in the middle of the pack. That's good news. Academics, economists, also in the middle of the pack. <coughs> At the very bottom, union leaders, 11% approval. Sindicais, 11% approval. Church leaders, leaders uh, members of parliament, dead last with 4% approval. I read this poll precisely as I was planning a run for the Chilean parliament. It was not happy news. I did my best to keep this from my family, especially from my mother, who was not keen on the idea. So um, clearly, leadership in all spheres of life, public, private, in politics, in academia, in the media, in business, is very challenging today. You know, the French poet Paul Valéry used to say, the future is not what it used to be. Well, clearly, leadership is not what it used to be. Um, and the challenges are many. We live at a time in which, first of all, in the world at large, but particularly here in Latin America, trust in institutions, in politicians is way down. Trust in democracy is also way down. There are many polls that suggest this, and this, of course, should uh, worry us. There are new dimensions uh, of leadership that uh, finally are being taken into account. I suspect this very same panel 10 years ago at the World Economic Forum would have been all men. Today it is not, and what a good thing that is. But clearly, let us not kid ourselves, in many dimensions of life, we are very, very far from having leadership in business, in politics, uh, that represents the wonderful diversity of our societies. Uh, there are other challenges, of course, the news media has changed tremendously. You know, we're all being watched 24 hours a day, and whatever we do, the news cycle is very short. That also brings uh, forward many, many challenges. And in Latin America, this is a time of elections. This is a time of populism that seems to be waning in some countries, but rising in others. It is a time in which we're trying to regain, sustain economic growth. Uh, and these, of course, are all tremendous challenges for leaders. So let me begin with um, Alejandro. Alejandro, you come from a country, Mexico, in which all of these problems are present, probably on steroids. The business community has an important role to play, but it faces all these credibility problems. What is business doing, and more importantly, what should business be doing in this regard? Thank you, Andres. Uh, as you say, all of this, these things are present uh, in Mexico. Biggest uh, lecture in Mexican history this year, over 3,000 positions uh, of uh, popular uh, countless uh, mayorships. And, uh, and the context is precisely one of low trust, low credibility of public institutions. A recent poll that was just published a few weeks ago, uh, one of the major Mexican newspapers reveals that all institutions have eroded its credibility. The ones that have uh, the, the highest credibility are the universities, the church, and the army. 
medium credibility are the Human Rights Commission, the printed media and business organizations, low credibility, uh, banks, television, the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. the Senate, the President, the police, uh, House of Representatives, uh, the union leaders, and the political parties mm -hmm. are at the very, very bottom. Uh, the presidential approval rate is only 21%, so it's a very, very low rate. And this low credi credibility also goes hand in hand with a perception that things have gotten worse. In fact, I, I don't know if any of you saw a, a, a study that was published by the Pew Research Center at the end of last year. And uh, it asked uh, people in 50 countries if things were better or worse than 50 years ago. The countries at the top of the list were Vietnam, India, and South Korea, where about 88% of the population believes they're better off than 50 years ago. In the, uh, but in the bottom of the, of the list is Latin America. Uh, Brazil, for instance, only 35% of Brazilian thinks that they're better off than 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. In Peru and Colombia, only about 27 and 29%. And at the very bottom of the list, Mexico, only 13% of Mexicans mm -hmm. thinks, uh, believe things are better off than, 30, uh, than 50 years ago. And Venezuela is the very last one, where only 10% of the population believes that they're better off. Um, why is this uh, when, in many respects, Latin America has, has made tremendous uh, improvements in many indicators? I mean, if you look at my country in Mexico, the GDP per capita 50 years ago mm -hmm. was a third of what it is today. Life expectancy is 14 years higher today than 50 <coughs> years ago. Infant mortality has decreased by 85%, mm -hmm. illiteracy. Uh, even extreme poverty, as measured by the World Bank, uh, $190 a day, has decreased by 78%. So um, there's so a sort of a cognitive dissonance, you know, between the perception and the reality. And I think this cognitive dissonance has to do with the, uh, the lack of ru rule of law. The problem in Latin America is that mm -hmm. with only 8% of the world population, we have 40% of the homicides mm -hmm. in the world. And of the 50 most violent cities in the world, 42 are in Latin America. Uh, 12 in Mexico, 17 in Brazil, three in Colombia, five in Venezuela, four in Central America, and two in the Caribbean. So um, this has to do obviously also with the, the failed drug policy. You know, we've been uh, sort of pedaling in a static bicycle. You know, for 50 years, we've been combating drugs in the same way, and it's evident, uh, evident that it's not uh, working. So um, uh, in Mexico, for instance, even though uh, th there's been important reforms uh, during this administration, you know, the President uh, Peña approved uh, education reform, telecommunications, labor, uh, competition, and energy reforms. Um, the perception is that, uh, you know, his approval rating is, is dismal, is very low because of the perception of corruption, but also because of the, of the violence, you know, uh, in, in the country. So um, uh, anyway, in, in this context, people are willing to vote for the unknown, and that's what we're facing right now. You know that, uh, People are willing to vote, you know, for anti-systemic candidate. People that will uh, promise, you know, uh, that they will solve everything even if they don't have sound uh, political strategies or public policies. And even with some frightening uh, strategies, because for instance, the leading candidate right now in the polls in Mexico, mm -hmm. he's already announced that he wants to undo the educational reform that was critical, uh, that introduces teacher evaluation. And also uh, that he wants to undo the part of the energy reform. So. Um, uh, also, it's sort of like going back to an economic nationalism. So what can the, the business uh, community do? Well, I think we can work on two fronts. One is strengthening the rule of law. I think that's the, the key element. And two, working for inclusive growth. I think for many years, we devoted most of our attention to getting the macroeconomic uh, right, uh, to lowering inflation, to getting the right public policies in place. But we probably didn't do enough to strengthen the rule of law and also to do complementary policies that would include those left behind. Wonderful, Alejandro, many thanks. I'm gonna ask my fellow panelists to keep answers short so that everybody has a chance and then we can move on to questions from the floor. Luisa, Maria Cristina, for either one of you, who wants to take it? Uh, a free media, of course, is key to democracy. Um, and uh, in Latin America, we have a much more vigorous media than we did a couple decades ago. That's something to celebrate. But uh, the media is also being challenged at a time of uh, short news cycles, fake news, post-truth, and all of that. Um, in Brazil, in Latin America, 
how do we have at the same time a free inquisitive media, but one that contributes not just to the very short you know, uh, fight, but to a longer view, a more serene view of a nation's problems. Can we reconcile these two things, or is that impossible? Can we, sorry? Reconcile. Reconcile. Vamos falar em português, os brasileiros aqui. É, eu acho que é um, é um desafio, eu acho que uh, para a mídia e para todos nós, eu acho que uh, nós temos que diferenciar fake news de informações distorcidas. Fake news são aquelas informações criadas uh, de uma forma uh, a prejudicar alguém, a obter um ganho financeiro fácil, a, a ter um uso político é, não claro, e, mas eu acho que, ao mesmo tempo é, que elas afetam, representam um risco para a democracia, também é um risco é, a gente tentar tutelar e agora, num período eleitoral, é, a gente esperar que a justiça eleitoral seja muito protetora. Há uma tendência no Brasil, e talvez em alguns países latino-americanos, de um excesso de proteção, como se os eleitores fossem inocentes, fossem indefesos, vulneráveis. Eu acho que o eleitor deve ser exposto. The uh, electors should be exposed to all types of reflection. This is a maturing process regarding this distortion of news. This has always existed way before the internet appeared. Of course, this now has gained speed, but it has always existed. So this is part of a learning curve from uh, voters. It is also dangerous to hope that a duopoly, like we have with Google and Facebook, that they make this control of information. Society should not delegate uh, to those who are not committed to democracy and they do not have the expertise to see what is well investigated news with the method with precise criteria and credibility. This is a task that is up to professional journalists. And I'm hoping we will all interact um, with each other as much as possible. Alejandro was saying that the business community should be contributing to the rule of law. Brazil is a country where some companies, by no means all, have contributed to the breakdown of the rule of law. Uh, and that, of course, creates a credibility crisis. Uh, you're a woman who runs a magazine. You're also a businesswoman. Uh, what to do about this? Good afternoon to all. Uh, about uh, the press, I am in favor of the free press, but it has a price to pay. I am able to <coughs> attend three e events. I try to explain what I do. I try to speak well uh, about what I'm doing. But they just published the, the shoes I was wearing in all three events instead of speaking of what I, I told. So press in Brazil is a free press, uh, and uh, we still need to fight for uh, that it continues this way. So. Uh, um, Businesses, uh, uh, companies uh, uh, were born with the sacrifices and the founders had to dedicate themselves a lot to uh, found and have their companies uh, to grow. And they have to forget the social side of the company. And now I'm fighting for my company so that my company is uh, as well social and earn money is profitable. And I confess this is not easy to achieve. It's much more difficult. but. I'm really satisfied to see this World Economic Forum with such interesting subjects about social issues, diversity, in which I, I took part. With a, a more uh, equitative economy, we'll have more social results, and it, it's coming. It's a coming of age, and it's since. Uh, taxes in Brazil are very high and everything is very expensive. It's been a serious issue and the uh, uh, 
quick wash uh, fight uh, of the justice system resulted against corruption. I think it's, it, it, it is given bear, it, that's born fruit. And Magazine Louisa has, has been audited uh, for 15 years and we pay the price to be an international company. I said to my auditors, I pay you so expensive and you speak, uh, you say bad things about my company because auditing but it, it was worth it, but not everybody, since I am a woman, I come from a family background where uh, the share uh, prices is not as interesting, but I was benefited all the shares, it uh, wasn't worth a thing, and my family didn't give uh, much about the value of our share, the criteria of my family, the importance of family. Uh, I did my homework before time, and it helped us a lot in our business. And leadership nowadays, I'm speaking for all uh, company CEOs. We need to uh, stop believing that we're banned. Uh, president of companies and CEOs need to embrace uh, diversity, the social side of the company, not to be uh, uh, to take the place of the of the government, but 60% of our population earn less than 2,000 reais. The Chinese uh, ladies working in our companies, they have uh, four hours of public transportation. They spend uh, four hours in in in. Uh, in the transportation, the women need to be, companies need to be aware of the people working in their companies. So there is an awareness growing in Brazil. It is changing this, uh, this uh, mentality because the company who doesn't take care of the social side will won't have a consumers anymore because consumers, young consumers nowadays are much more demanding. So it's changing and I really believe in the free press and in my shoes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we're, while we are on Brazil, we have a leading Brazilian banker here sitting directly to my left. Let me pepper you with two questions. Um, yes, a lot of Brazilians live with a wage of under 2,000 reais a month. That's, um, in dollar terms, not a lot. Um, Brazil is in the middle of economic recovery, but uh, it is new. It is starting many years of... Um, very slow growth, even contraction, the biggest recession in a long time. What can the financial sector do to help this recovery? And, um, and beyond that, you were a person running one of the biggest banks in Brazil. I want to take you back to the question that I asked Luisa. Clearly faith in business, faith in the business community for obvious reasons in Latin America, in Brazil has plummeted. Banks tend to be institutions that do an important job but are not necessarily loved. Can bankers be loved in Brazil? And how? <laughs> it is changing. The idea of bankers in Brazil is changing, is evolving. Não precisa rir tanto. You, you didn't need to love that much, Luisa. I just wanted, before answering the first question, to to refer myself to... We are discussing new leadership, the, the, the coming of a new leadership and the meaning of leadership. And we opened the newspapers today and we saw the homicide of uh, young woman uh, rights, Marie de Fay, it was uh, assassinated. I uh, would like to uh, show my condolences. I like that this crime to be explained and uh, judged as soon as possible. She was fighting for the woman's right in the uh, real slum. Now to your question. Actually, we are. Uh, Starting our economic recovery after the largest crisis we've experienced. In two years, we lost 8% of the GDP. This had never occurred before. It was a crisis of the biggest proportion. We grew 1% yes, last year, and this for this year, we are uh, forcing a growth of 3%. I think the banking sector has some uh, re 
basic functions. It, 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 remains, it needs to be remain healthy, first of all. A healthy banking sector is uh, pivotal for any economy that wants to, to grow. You don't have a growing economy without a healthy banking sector. A healthy banking sector worries about the sustainability of its activity. Uh, sustainability of its activity means not only looking to the bottom line or the bottom line of next year, but try to develop its activities concerned with its clients. I had the feeling that uh, we are progressively doing this in this modern world. We uh, speak of client centricity and the client's journey. He said it in English. And we're following the activities of people that we're serving our clients. We're trying to listen to them, to understand them, and to see each one of them in uh, every aspect of their journey, opening a, a current account, making a loan uh, for a vehicle or an apartment, to try to identify the pain points, he said it in English also, to try to solve their problems. I was thinking that this is a, a great gap between our political leaders today in Brazil and within the business world. It, it, it's become standard. They should be the good leaders that our country needs should be able to listen to their constituents and to be uh, concerned by the pen points of the journey of their clients or voters when he, he needs housing, health, public transportation. I think that this exercise uh, new technologies worsen the current scenario because they uh, increase the gap, inequalities, the unbalance of income. But on the other side, the new technologies enable us to listen to much more people. So we have the tools today to listen to people. I think leaders should uh, take advantage of this to try to identify which are the real needs and to dedicate, commit themselves to to uh, resolve those needs. And now coming back to banks, I think you, to solve those problems, you have two groups of ways. First group is how you solve what you can do on the short term. In the economy, you have this, in the banks, that's what we do, immediate measures. And the second group are the uh, structural reforms that you need to prepare the country on the long run. So I could draw a parallel between the managing activity of a company, I think which is uh, the learning, the takeaway that you can take for the political leaders and how you manage a country as you could manage a company. If Yes, banks can be loved, and that's the way they can do it. It's difficult to love someone uh, uh, from which you need so much as the banking services. The contact points are immense and when you have a very broad uh, contact surface, you have failures and those failures try to impress us more than uh, that what works and the service are well served, well supplied. So I have the feeling that will we all be, be subject to the people's frustration, our clients, in some way, at some point of the time. So our work consists of uh, remaining humble, to acknowledge that a continuous uh, improvement effort is needed and to uh, make our best efforts to try to solve those problems, our, our clients' problems. And I also have a vision for a country, a broader vision, and not only restricted to the banking sector, knowing that through our activity, we are leveraging the activity and we, we are enabling uh, that when uh, people have uh, their basic needs uh, supplied, you can enable that the large companies can finance their projects, which will, uh, as uh, side effects, uh, create jobs. Candidate. You're absolutely right. You uttered one important word, humility.
a generation ago that would have not been a component of leadership today, very much it is. Let me move to my friend Nairi at the other end here. Nairi, you run one of the world's leading public policy schools. You, you train technocrats. Mm -hmm. But uh, technocrats today are also a bit out of fashion. During the Brexit campaign, uh, a British minister said, Britain is tired of experts. We don't need experts anymore. Mm -hmm. And you and I are in the business of training experts. So um, what can we do to make sure that our technocrats are not just technocrats, that they're also leaders um, with a sense of mission? How do you instill that into your students at Oxford? Thank you, Andres. Um, so certainly we're not just a school for technocrats mm -hmm. because my colleagues and I profoundly believe that we need a new kind of politician around the world. Mm -hmm. The fact that in pretty much every democratic election of the last two years, a majority of people have voted against the establishment parties and against the establishment, whether it's France or Italy or in your own country, Chile, you were telling us um, that it was the outside candidate that came within 2% of voting. In, in France, the two major parties just collapsing in support in the British Brexit vote, etc. So these are, these are very difficult times. This is a huge warning signal to every democracy about what's going wrong. And so I think what we're trying to do in the school is first learn as quickly as we can what are the lessons that we should learn from the radical populist movements. Why are they succeeding? It is not because people and voters are stupid. And so the three lessons I would draw from that is first, they're listening. It's what Candido Brahe just said. It's that they are listening. And so in, in Brazil, Luisa told us yesterday, 60% of Brazilian households are living on less than 2,000 reals a month. So when a candidate like Bolsonaro says, I'm going to give each of you a gun. I think a lot of people say, well, that's just crazy. Forgetting that what a lot of people hear is, finally, there's a politician that understands that my problem is security. I might not agree that we should give every Brazilian a gun, but at least he understands that my problem is security or what my problem is. So the first thing is teaching people to listen. And that's hard, because for the last 30 years, politicians have used PR companies, focus groups, online surveys, and that is not listening. A great example of how to listen was Macron's campaign, where he sent human beings out on foot to 300,000 households in France to find out what did people really care about before he began his campaign. So that's, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is about communication. Everybody says the populists have simplistic messages, make America great, whatever it is, take back control. But simple messages do not have to be simplistic. And what I think we need to teach politicians and technocrats mm -hmm. is that it takes a lot of time to take something which is quite complicated and turn it into something which is simple and intuitive for people to understand. But if you're not investing that time, you're not permitting democratic <coughs> citizens to hold you to account. So that's the second thing, is really learning to take the time to communicate clearly. But the third, I think, is by far the most important, and that involves everybody in this room, which is to think about what is the transformative vision that politics in the center is offering to the population. I, I'm gonna confess that even in this country, having heard about the 60% of Brazilians who are only just making ends meet, I find it dismaying to hear politicians focus almost exclusively on the need to balance the budget and control inflation. That's not a vision that mobilizes people. It's, of course, sensible. But I think what we can do in this room, private sector leaders, public sector leaders, is come together to help our politicians have a much bolder, transformative vision. I always think of Britain 
In 1945, the end of the war, a country whose debt was 250% of GDP, so completely bankrupt. And what did Clement Attlee do? He created a huge, bold vision of decent housing, of a national health service, and of decent schools for the nation's children. So what's our equivalent today? I'm not saying we should wait for governments to come up with a huge government vision. I'm saying everybody in this room could help start thinking about what that bold vision is that will speak to the 60% of people who are not in this room and are using the one weapon that they have, which is their vote, mm -hmm. to tell this room and other rooms around the room that they cannot live with the status quo. So I think leaders, leaders have a big task in front of them. In the school, we're doing our best to equip leaders from a, about 80 different countries with those skills to listen, to have much better clear principles and a, an ability to communicate them, and to have a transformative vision and an ability to mobilize people from all sectors to actually achieve that vision. Thank you, Nairi. I think that's uh, right on. I think that uh, things like the budget deficit or the national debt are instruments. And we often fail as leaders when we speak in lofty terms about the instruments and not about the goals. Those are instruments that make a society more stable, to make the economy grow, to have better jobs and more dignity. But way too often, certainly we economists are guilty of that, but I think business leaders, um, politicians are also guilty of that, we stop at the instruments, and what really matters is the goals, and uh, often we're not very good at communicating about that. Paul, you run a very large multinational. You operate in many countries. Maybe a generation ago in Latin America, multinationals were viewed with some suspicion. Today, in one dimension, I think things have changed. Precisely now that we think about sound hiring and firing practices, gender equality, transparency, uh, people in Latin America often look at multinationals, European multinationals, Canadian multinationals, American multinationals sometimes as uh, institutions that can bring these better practices. But at the same time as others say, oh, you're importing foreign values. I imagine in Asia you get some of that. Um, how can these multinationals in fact be purveyors of uh, better leadership and better practices, particularly when it comes to the labor market? which is uh, a corner of our life in Latin America that works very poorly. I'm going to answer that. <clears throat> but I'm going to first uh, refer to your <clears throat> ranking there that you say uh, the, the actors of soap operas are well liked. And actually, sometimes I believe that I'm in a soap opera too. So. <laughs> and, but you have to be very low there. And that is linked with a societal perception that America big is bad. Where there's a reaction in society which is in the line. It's not against multinationals for the multinationals. It's about uh, the establishment. And uh, that is linking up to quite a few comments. Mm -hmm. But the topic is about uh, a new era of leadership. Uh, and that goes back to leadership also in companies. And, and I'm going to refer to a, uh, an ancient uh, Chinese uh, philosopher, uh, Lao Tse, who said, uh, we are not only responsible for what we do, we actually uh, even more responsible for what we do not do. And, and and somewhere, and the title of the, of, of the forum here is uh, Turning Point. And um, so if, if, if we all, also po politics, uh, don't take the right turn and engage in the right journey in a continent that has a permanent future, because that's uh, now for so many years that we speak about uh, Latin America and uh, it has all in front and it's just to make it happen, and we're still talking the same language. So somewhere we are on a turning point. And uh, for what we do not do, we're going to be taken responsible. For what we do is one thing, and not taking the right decisions and not seeing the long-term perspective on things is something that would be bad. That would be proof of no leadership. Leadership is not about your time. Leadership is not about your tenure. It's about what you give over to the next leader. And uh, leadership is not about uh, uh, your survival or, or your success. It's about the success of what you lead. 
Leadership is not about short term and today, it's about long term. And somewhere, that's the call upon where leadership really comes in. And, and we are on a, on a turning point. You see Latin America, we have these elections coming up, uh, six uh, this year, six next year. These are all like good chances of re-inspiration of going and making the right turn. And, and, and it is linked with uh, really making stronger institutions, uh, reforms, structural reforms. Everybody need, knows what needs to be done. And yet, it's not done. Short term takes over, next election, etc. Populism comes in, and actually populism is a way of formulating simply what the others didn't do. That's populism. Talking about certain parts that the others didn't touch, that they are sensitive to the population. And, and, and then this whole inclusiveness. And that's where also business leaders, but political leaders, you're always gonna have tension. You're always gonna get to square one if you don't care for the biggest part of your population. And we didn't do that. And specifically in Latin America where, where, where the differentiation between the different classes is getting bigger and bigger. And it is already on a low level. Uh, you spoke about the 2,000 reais uh, that people live with. So, um, uh, and we have a unique opportunity in this continent, in the world in general, but in this continent specifically, global growth environment. And Latin America has always been uh, positively influenced by global growth because we have raw materials that we can export. It's a unique uh, opportunity uh, to embrace. Um, we have a young population and we have a, a democratic uh, dividend that can be played for the next 20, 25 years before it turns into a liability of an older population. Embrace this. So somewhere there's a call towards leadership, not politics, leadership which is linked with having a contextual view, see the broader thing, not think about yourself next election and shaping this, this societies here. And uh, another uh, uh, call upon leadership is to integrate the continent. And it's good to see Mercosur, it's good to see the Pacific Islands, and, and actually it's very strange to see the Mercosur looking east and the Pacific looking west. Mm -hmm. Hey, start looking at each other first. Mm -hmm. And integrate, uh, trade, open markets has always good been driving growth and inclusive growth. So somewhere um, that's called upon. No companies. I think leadership in companies has to embrace also uh, this, you're gonna be judged on what you do not. And look, we are not about uh, shareholders alone. We are about stakeholders in general. Companies, <clears throat> economic activity in general is part of society. It's not an isolated dimension. And, and, and we as companies, we are linked to society and we should take care of shareholders, but we should take care also of society and we should see where we intersect with society through our actions. We call that in Nestle creating shared value. That means we have to take care of our shareholders, but at the same time, through everything we do, we should intersect with society in a positive way, creating shared value. And that is something that uh, you see more and more leaderships and companies being explicit in saying, formulating, expressing this. There's an awareness. A company cannot be successful over time when it um, doesn't take care of society and the environment the communities it's working in. We have been, Nestle, almost 100 years in this continent, and we stayed in good and bad times. And we had bad times. And we are still in many countries where basically <coughs> there's no justification to be there in the short term. But we engaged, we committed to our consumers, to our suppliers, to many of them <clears throat> farmers. That is leadership. And that's what I feel my role is too, to keep that very, very high in my uh, company and uh, being explicit. We're gonna be criticized. We are a quite a sizable company. We are a high tree, catch more wind. Well, then don't hide away from the discussion, engage in dialogue and uh, engage in explaining and, and be explicitly part of societies like uh, we're trying to do. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question to the panel, and then we're going to open it up to the floor. I'm going to throw this one wide open. Um, we're all worried about populism, and I think we all agree that um, populism arises from a lack of connection between leadership <coughs> and the governed. Um, Everybody's concerned around the room that 60% of Brazilians live on less than 2,000 reais, about $600 a month. But we can't leave it there. We can't simply throw out the problem. We need to suggest some solutions. So let me solicit from one of you, um, you could look back, we're all leaders here. 
one thing you would do differently from what you did in the past, or maybe something that you're planning to do now that will change that perception, that will make this disconnect with your clients, with the voters, with your readers less sharp and uh, thereby, you know, diffuse the threat of populism. I need one answer from one person, one of the leaders in the, in the panel. And then we'll open it up to the floor. Nothing you'd do differently? Alejandro. Oh, I think um, something that uh, the business community can do better uh, in my country, in Mexico, but I think throughout Latin America is to be more engaged. I think uh, sometimes we're not engaged enough. I think we have to do more in terms of not only doing corporate social responsibility uh, programs within our companies. I think we have to be real uh, corporate citizens and behave like such and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, get involved in also uh, you know, trying to uh, shape the, the vision that was mentioned, you know, the bold vision and, and uh, transformative vision, but also, you know, signaling when public policy is failing or, you know, uh, trying to uh, just be, be more constructive and more involved as corporate citizens. I think that's something that would, you know, uh, lessen social tension and that would uh, uh, reduce, you know, the threat of, of populism. Is it possible to add something? Absolutely. Maria Cristina. As for past experiences, you know, I think that in Brazil, and I mentioned in other countries of Latin America, the same, there is no more room for what we call uh, electoral fraud. A candidate defending a stance and once elected communicate that the economic contractor is very serious and uh, will switch to a very dif different program. And so lies and pledges our country is vaccinated against those lies and those electoral uh, frauds. Uh, and Gar uh, Woods uh, said very properly that it is, it is really necessary to listen uh, to the population, to what uh, they had to say. Uh, you need to inspire, to be inspirational, and the, the politicians uh, are able to adjust, and that uh, through reforms only they can, that the country can grow, it can uh, uh, raise the income uh, along the years, but that you also need to inspire people, to give hope to people, but carefully, because we've got former governments here in Brazil, uh, uh, political programs called Minha Casa Minha Vida for housing for the poor, we had the FIES uh, credit for students, CSS Fronteras, students, Brazilian students with uh, tuition to study abroad, uh, 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 free without, uh, but they were un uh, unmanageable and were not viable and they uh, helped, uh, they complicated our budget, our public budget. So uh, future candidates, be careful. Right. Uh, uh, I would add that um, candidates that run on one platform and then do something else when in office were not invented in Brazil. A gentleman called Menem in Argentina, once upon a time, did the same thing. A guy called Fujimori in Peru also tried it. Um, it's a pretty common habit. We're going to open up the discussion to the floor. You're going to ask a question. Please identify yourself and be brief, because we have very little time left, and I'd like to get a couple questions out. Here in the uh, floor is yours. Do we have a microphone? There we go. Hi, Gabriel Alfonso from Caracas, Venezuela. I love to listen to the vision that you're, tr that you're bringing, specifically Ms. Woods, with the transformation vision. What can be an advice for leaders to reconnect with humanity, understanding that all the answers are within our soul, if we really connect with people, but not erasing populism, because it, it is a fine line. A specific advice I will appreciate. Thank you. Nairi, you've been asked to comment on the soul. <laughs> Can you do that briefly? <laughs> well, so it, what I would have said to what we can do, I think a bit answers this, because, I, and, I, and I, again, I call on this room to help here, because we actually need a new economic social model. And I don't think we can escape that. We've all lived in 30 years where we can solve these problems by growing. And so we've said, how do we get growth 
and we've, we've, we've believed that growth will trickle down and, and, and lift up lives beneath us. That's not happening anymore. The labor share of income is declining. So people have very good reason to feel anxious. They've got robots on one side taking their jobs. They've got outsourcing on another. They feel anxious and nervous. And frankly, the economic data says to them, you should feel anxious. So what's our model? And I, I like your question about the soul because this is not just about economic policy and redistribution. This is about dignity. A lot of the populism is appealing to people's self-worth and their dignity, their esteem, their identity. So I think the new economic model or the new compact between in each society has to be one that doesn't just redistribute. I, I don't like the idea of just a universal basic income or something. It has to be something that ensures that people have dignity. And that's why I use the 1945 model, because that was one that said, to be a dignified, participating citizen in this country, you need a decent house, you need to know that if someone gets sick, you won't be plunged into poverty, and you need your chance, your kids to have a fair chance at getting an education. And I think we have to come back to some of those basics. Thank you, Nairi. There was a, uh, uh, yes, a hand over here, please. Good afternoon, my name is Marcela. I'm from the Mileus Food Safety. Uh, I take part in a group of startups invited to this forum to debate uh, interconnecting matters uh, concerning startups. I'd like to hear from you, leaders, how you deal with the search of Inovadoras, que Those estão trazendo muitas tecnologias para a gente nos dias de hoje. Como que vocês lidam com isso? Como você lida 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 uh, thank you for the question. Our uh, perspective uh, regarding the startups and the Cube, which is a, which is a incubating company that we've launched within Itaú, uh, uh, supporting 200 uh, companies, 200 startups. Our posture is a, of a curiosity and learning. We've learned a lot with those startups we are financing, starting with the way they organize work within their company. And the majority of startups that we've learned to know, we watch a very cooperative uh, way of uh, management. This is what we're looking for. And we'll try to reproduce within our large bank. When I see their organigrams, their chart flows, uh, uh, management 30 years ago, the general theory of management, they showed us, they, they showed us organigrams. And I have the feeling that although they're still teach organigrams in uh, management business schools, I think that you won't see any more in a few years uh, that kind of organigram that uh, they've known. Interaction within the startups is uh, much more cooperative, much more collaborative. And this requires, re requires from us, large companies, a uh, uh, change in mindsets in uh, human resources. The majority of uh, the incentive tools or management tools are turn to the assessment of individual performance and we are led to watch much more uh, uh, the collective performance. So I think this comes in large part uh, how much innovative uh, companies can be when they work uh, in a more cooperative way. It's a very, very, very important question. Um, and um, the society actually uh, is, 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 is going to be shaped by these new entrepreneurs. Actually, the WEF is very strong in this and with the new shapers and they really embrace this uh, young entrepreneurial spirit and, 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 and make it flourish over time. And 
So, and it doesn't go against, hey, established companies and the smaller ones are competing. <coughs> Actually, we, we as a company, we embrace youth dramatically. Uh, youth unemployment, especially also here, <coughs> is a ticking time bomb, societal time bomb. And um, so, embracing youth and, and installing this mindset of don't claim a future, work for one, go for it, and embrace them, um, uh, allow, open your doors for them so that they can see how it goes and establish uh, companies so that they can take that knowledge out, embrace them, uh, allow them to have a decent job or at least have some, some, some anxiety of newness out because they can experience. We, we are doing quite a few projects also with governments and specifically in Argentina, also here in Brazil, we do quite a, a, a lot of these youth uh, engagement initiatives. Uh, that are really uh, driving quite a lot of, of I would say, uh, uh, motivation for, for, for the younger generations. This is a young continent, and a uh, young population in this continent is definitely <coughs> part of the solution for the future. We should embrace it, exactly as you said. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir, in the back there. Alfio, you are from Chile. Um, there's been a sort of a mixed um, conversation here about leadership, sometimes mixing leadership and management. So if you have to pick something for our policymakers, will they be leaders with a bold vision? We've got Chavez and Castro in the mm -hmm. region with very bold uh, visions in the past, uh, the wrong vision if you ask me. Um, so what do we need? But you cannot have a hybrid model here. So would you pick a policymaker as someone who is a leader or someone who is a manager, a problem solver? Great question. I'll, I'll jump in on that. I, because we think about this a lot and in the school and I'm sure everyone in this room. So leaders have to be able to do two things and they've got to be able to do both things outstandingly. One is to help, is, is to forge the vision within the group. And the second is to mobilize people to achieve it. There is no point being a leader with a vision that nobody is mobilizing towards and people mobilize best towards a vision when they've been part of creating it. So to me, those two things, I don't think there is a difference between leadership and management. The leader that says, I'm leading, but nobody's following me is not leading at all, right? Or the leader that says, I have a great vision, but nobody's implementing it is failing to lead. So I think the two things are bound together. <laughs> it's about vision and mobilization. I would like to add, I would like to add something. At our company, we say, well, leaders take people further than they imagined they could do, and they take you further than you thought you could do. And we say at our company that if you want to have people aligned, you must have mind, heart, and pockets. So in the minds, that's when they participate from the strategy of the company. They give their opinions, regardless of the level of their jobs. From our hearts, that's when we are really true to our principles when they feel that the company is true. And in their pockets, that's when we share profit. We have to share profit with them. So all participants are part of profit, the profit sharing program. So I would uh, uh, add the pocket to that dimension. The pocket is really important for leaders. Leaders have to feel that the le leadership is sharing profits. They're having, and I fully agree with what you said before. Thank you so much. I think that's a wonderful note on which to um, begin to bring this panel to a conclusion. I think one common concern is that populism is not a good thing, uh, but populists are leaders, as Mr. Ulloa was mentioning, and to that kind of populistic demagoguery, we need to counterpose a different kind of leadership. And that different kind of leadership must uh, touch on the head, touch on the pocket, but perhaps most importantly, it must touch on the heart. Let me, with that thought, uh, give everybody on the panel. And now I'm going to ask the, um, my fellow panelists to remain seated for a second, and we're going to pass it on to uh, Olivier Schwab, who's going to have the final say. Andres, thank you uh, for summarizing this wonderful and lively panel. And I would like to thank our co-chairs in particular, uh, not just for uh, these, uh, uh, this hour of wisdom that we shared with you, but also for helping us prepare um, this meeting. 
I trust, uh, dear partners, that you were inspired by the knowledge shared along the program and that innovative ideas and new partnerships have been forged here in Sao Paulo. We hope also that you will leave with uh, a clear assessment of the region's electoral context and the opportunities and challenges lying ahead to advance Latin America's development agenda. Um, among the areas that have particularly resonated is the need to continue with structural reform agenda to better position the region to meet some of its remaining challenges. The need to strengthen and modernize institution, the rule of law, and promote productivity and competitiveness. Now, most of all, um, we've perceived a clear consensus on the importance to embrace technolo technology to accelerate necessary changes in the economic, political, and also social transformations. So with this in mind, we're very proud to announce uh, the prospect of opening in Sao Paulo an affiliate center of the fourth industrial revolution of the World Economic Forum as a catalyzer to assist in the adoption of new technologies with a vast potential for societal impact. We're also very excited to have here uh, 50 startups from the region uh, whose program will continue this afternoon and uh, I hope that many of you will be able to join. We also have our other community sessions which continue this afternoon and promise to be as exciting as the public program which we've had over the past one and a half days. Thank you very much for joining us. I wish you bon appétit.